President. Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that for the duration of the Senate's consideration of SCON Res 5, the majority and Republican managers of the concurrent resolution, while seated or standing at the manager's desks, be permitted to deliver floor remarks, retrieve, review, and edit documents, and send email and other data communications from text displayed on wireless personal digital assistant devices and tablet devices. I further ask unanimous consent that the use of calculators be permitted on the floor during consideration of the budget resolution. Further, that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the resolution if necessary, consistent with the amendments adopted during Senate consideration, including calculating the associated change in the net interest function and incorporating the effect of such adopted amendments on the budgetary aggregates for federal revenues, the amount by which the federal revenues should be changed, new budget authority, budget outlays, deficits, public debt, and debt held by, held by the public. Finally, that the following staff members from my staff and from Senator Graham's staff be given all access floor passes for consideration of the budget resolution as con res 5. Majority staff, Michael Jones, Joshua Smith, Michael Lawless, Ethan Rosencrantz, uh, and Ari Robin uh, Hoft, and Warren Gunnels. Republican staff, Nick Myers, Matthew Giroux, Matthew Joe Keeley, Doug Diziak, and Matthew Rimkunas. Objection? Without objection. Mr. President. Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I rise today to speak in support of the budget resolution that was introduced today. Mr. President, let us be clear and let us in the Senate understand what the American people know all too well. And that is that our country is currently experiencing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression and the worst public health emergency in over 100 years. January marked the deadliest month of the pandemic with over 90,000 Americans losing their lives as a result of COVID-19. 90,000 Americans in one month. In the midst of all of this, over 90 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured and are unable to afford to go to a doctor when they become ill. The isolation and the anxiety caused by this pandemic has resulted in a horrible increase in mental illness, in depression, in anxiety, and in suicidal ideation. Mr. President, today, as we speak, over half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck, including millions of essential workers who put their lives on the line each and every day. More than 24 million Americans are unemployed, underemployed, or have given up looking for work. While hunger in this country, hunger in the richest country in the history of the world is at the highest level that we have seen in decades. Because of lack of income, over 14 million Americans are behind on their rent, averaging some $5,800 a family. And many of those families face eviction all across this country. People are worried that when the moratorium on evictions ends, they're going to be thrown out of their homes, put out on the street. Americans who worry about eviction understand that they must not join the half a million Americans who are already homeless. That's some of what we are experiencing today. That's what the American people understand. Meanwhile, in the midst of this devastation to the working class and the middle class of our country, 
The wealthiest people in America are becoming much wealthier, and income and wealth inequality, a long-time problem, is now soaring. Incredibly, while families throughout the country are struggling to put food on the table to feed their kids, during this pandemic, 660 billionaires, not a whole lot of people, have increased their wealth by over $1 trillion. Mr. President, as a result of this pandemic, education in our country, from childcare to graduate school, is in chaos. The majority of young people in our nation have seen their education disrupted. Kids are not getting the learning that they need, falling further and further behind. And on top of that, it is likely that hundreds of colleges will soon cease to exist. Mr. President, in this moment of unprecedented crises, the Senate must respond through unprecedented action. The budget resolution we are debating today is simple and it is straightforward. It will enable us to pass President Biden's $1.9 trillion emergency COVID relief plan through reconciliation with 51 votes instead of 60. Now, Mr. President, I have heard from some of my Republican colleagues who tell us that, well, this reconciliation concept, that's a radical idea. Why are you using reconciliation? And they are telling us that it is absolutely imperative that we go forward in a bipartisan way and require 60 votes for passage. But I must say that when Republicans used this same reconciliation process, Mr. President, I didn't hear much about bipartisanship at that point. In fact, Republicans used the reconciliation process to provide trillions of dollars in tax breaks to the top 1% and large profitable corporations by a simple majority vote. The only people who voted for that bill were Republicans. No bipartisanship in that bill. My Republican colleagues used reconciliation to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for the drilling of oil, once again, by a simple majority. Only people who supported that were Republicans, not one Democrat. As we all remember, painfully, my Republican colleagues used the reconciliation process to try to repeal the Affordable Care Act and throw up to 32 million Americans off of the health care they currently have. And as you'll recall, Mr. President, that was a 100 percent partisan vote, which fortunately lost by one vote. Further, weeks, weeks before a presidential election, last election, my Republican colleagues pushed through their nominee for the Supreme Court with 50 votes. A few weeks before the election, not one Democrat supported that nominee. Totally partisan vote. Well, as the incoming chair of the Senate Budget Committee, <coughs> this is what I believe. If Republicans can use reconciliation to help the wealthy and the powerful and pass legislation strongly opposed by the American people, we can and must use reconciliation to help Americans recover from the worst economic and public health crisis in the modern history of our country. In other words, now is the time 
for this Congress to stand with the working class and the middle class of this country and do what the overwhelming majority of the American people want us to do. Mr. President, it is worth pointing out that poll after poll shows an overwhelming majority of Americans, over 70 percent, support what President Biden and what we are trying to do. They know we have got to act boldly. So I hope we will not hear much more about bipartisanship given my Republican colleagues' record on that issue. Mr. President, let us be clear, the working class of this country and the middle class are facing more economic desperation than at any time since the Great Depression. I have to tell you that to me, emotionally, it was a painful sight to see in my own city of Burlington, Vermont, hundreds of cars lined up so that families could get the food they needed to feed their kids. And what happened in Burlington is happening in every state of this country. People, many of whom have never had any public assistance at all, are now lining up to get emergency supplies of food in order to keep their families alive. Whether it is the pandemic, which is killing 3,000 people a day, whether it is the economic collapse, which is leaving millions of our people destitute, whether it is the disruption of education in this country, which means that kids are falling further and further behind, this Congress must act and act boldly. For too long, Mr. President, Congress has responded to the needs of the wealthy and the powerful and big money campaign contributors. Now is the time in this unprecedented set of crises for us to respond to the needs of working families, whether they're black or white or Latino, Native American or Asian American. Mr. President, it is no secret that millions of our fellow Americans are literally giving up on democracy, giving up on democracy. They think that the United States Congress and the United States government does not care a whit about the needs of working people. The people who go to work every day, who keep our country going, who put their lives on the line during this pandemic, and they look at us and they say, does anybody there in Washington, all you rich guys, do you understand what's going on in our lives? Well, this week during this debate, we are not only going to begin addressing the health and economic and educational crises we face, but maybe even more importantly, we're going to begin the process of restoring faith in the United States government. Maybe, just maybe, we can do what Abraham Lincoln talked about in the midst of the terrible Civil War. And that is, be a government, act like a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and not just powerful special interests and their lobbyists. What will this budget resolution mean for the average American? I know we're throwing out a lot of numbers, 1.9 trillion, a lot of money. What does it actually mean? How is it going to impact the lives of ordinary people? So let me just say a few words on that. Everybody is concerned about the pandemic, which has taken so many lives and caused so much illness and suffering. What this legislation is about is an effort to aggressively crush the pandemic and enable the American people to return to their jobs and schools by providing the funding necessary to establish a national emergency program 
to produce the quantity of vaccines that we need. We need to increase vaccine production. And equally important, we need to significantly improve the distribution of vaccines so that we get them into the arms of people as quickly as we can. What this legislation means is that during this severe economic downturn, we must make sure that every American, low-income people, working-class people, middle-class people, have the financial resources that they need to live with dignity. This budget resolution will allow us to keep the promises that we made to the American people and increase the $600 in direct payments for working-class adults and their kids up to $2,000, another $1,400. And Mr. President, I want you just to think, whether it's Connecticut or Vermont or South Carolina or any place else, you think that during this terrible crisis, what it will mean to an average family to suddenly get a check for $5,600 for a family of four on top of the $600 per person that they received a few weeks ago. Think about what that will mean to people who are losing hope right now. Passing this budget resolution will give us the tools we need to raise the minimum wage to a living wage of $15 an hour, expand unemployment benefits, expand the child tax credit, and prevent eviction, homelessness, and hunger. <coughs> Passing this budget resolution means that during this raging pandemic, we will be able to provide health care to millions of Americans who are uninsured and underinsured by expanding Medicaid and improving the Affordable Care Act and other approaches. Passing this budget resolution means that we will go a long, long way forward to addressing the long-term problem of childhood poverty in America. And that is that by expanding the child tax credit, we have the opportunity to cut childhood poverty in this country in half and no longer be the major country on earth which has one of the highest rates of childhood poverty. <coughs> Mr. President, let me very briefly mention a few of the specific provisions in the budget resolution uh, that will enable the Senate uh, to pass this budget under reconciliation. Mr. President, as I just mentioned, the overwhelming majority of the American people have told us very loudly and clearly that the $600 direct payment that Congress passed in December was a good start but is not enough. In this bill, we're going to increase that $600 by another $1,400. Mr. President, we cannot continue to allow workers in America to work at jobs that pay them a starvation wage. In the United States of America, jobs should lift you out of poverty, not keep you in it. So let us be clear, when we increase that minimum wage to $15 an hour, not only will we be providing a much needed raise for tens of millions of American workers, we will also, by the way, save taxpayers many billions of dollars each and every year. Moreover, Mr. President, this pandemic has caused tens of millions of American workers <clears throat> to lose their jobs through no fault of their own. For 45 consecutive weeks, unemployment claims have been higher than during the worst week of the Great Recession in 2008. This budget resolution that we are considering <clears throat> now will provide the funding necessary to provide 18 million Americans 
with $400 a week in supplemental unemployment benefits until the end of September. So if you are watching this, if you're watching TV now because you're unemployed when you'd rather be at work, understand that this bill will extend unemployment $400 on top of the normal unemployment your state provides till the end of September. We have not forgotten the unemployed. Further, Mr. President, all of us know that we have a child care crisis in America. It was severe before the pandemic. It is even worse now. This budget resolution would begin to provide the resources necessary to provide child care to 875,000 children in America. And it would expand the child tax credit from 2,000 to 3,000 and 3,600 for kids under the age of six. In other words, we hear what working families are going through, especially those who are struggling and have children. This will be a major, major step forward in improving lives and easing anxiety for young couples with kids. In addition, Mr. President, let us not forget, this pandemic has had a horrific toll on the finances of state and local governments, many of which are literally on the verge of bankruptcy. Over the past 10 months, state and local governments have laid off some 1.4 million workers, including 50,000 in December alone. These are teachers, firemen, cops, and other municipal and state employees. The budget resolution that we are debating today would provide $350 billion to prevent mass layoffs of public sector workers in state and local governments. The Congressional Budget Office has said that the best bang for the buck of all the money Congress has passed so far for COVID relief is to aid state and local governments. Further, Mr. President, if there's one thing this horrific pandemic should have taught all of us is that we must no longer consider health care as simply an employee benefit. Health care must be a human right. It is unacceptable to my mind that over 14 million Americans have lost their employer-provided health benefits over the past 10 months. 14 million workers have lost their health coverage, impacting even more people because there are wives and husbands and children involved as well. This budget resolution will, among other health care provisions, enable the Senate to expand Medicaid. It will allow more Americans to receive the primary care that they need through community health centers. It will address the serious shortage of doctors and nurses in rural areas and inner cities by expanding the National Health Service Corps. And it will make sure that our veterans receive the health care that they have earned and deserve by increasing funding at the VA by $17 billion. In addition, Mr. President, in the wealthiest country on Earth, we can no longer tolerate hunger in America. And this budget resolution will enable the Senate to provide nutrition assistance to tens of millions of families struggling to get the food that they need, and that includes the disabled and the elderly, by expanding SNAP, WIC, and the pandemic EBT program. Mr. President, in America today, some 14 million Americans owe an average of $5,800 in back rents. If we do not get our act together, tens of millions of Americans will soon face the possibility of being thrown out of their apartments and homes and onto the street. This budget resolution that we are debating will provide the funding for rent relief, utility assistance, and mortgage relief 
to millions of tenants and homeowners who are in danger of eviction or foreclosure. And it also, Mr. President, deals with the shame of homelessness in America. Today, in the midst of the dead of winter, we cannot have hundreds of thousands of Americans sleeping in homeless shelters in their cars or out on the streets. And right here, walking distance from this capital, there are tents located in parks where Americans are sleeping in the middle of the winter. Mr. President, this resolution provides investments in appropriate housing that will protect uh, the health of our people and help decre decrease COVID-19 transmissions with safe and socially distant housing. Further, Mr. President, all of us must acknowledge that there is a pension crisis in America today. As a result of the greed on Wall Street, workers and retirees in multi-employer pension plans are in danger of seeing their retirement benefits cut by as much as 65 percent. That is unacceptable. Promises were made to those workers, and the United States Congress cannot renege on those promises. Mr. President, not only is this $1.9 trillion emergency COVID relief package the right thing to do from a moral perspective and a public policy perspective, it is exactly what the overwhelming majority of the American people want us to do. According to a recent poll from Change Research, nearly 70 percent of the American people support President Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID-19 plan. Eighty-three percent support boosting direct payments from 600 to 2,000. Sixty-four percent support raising the federal minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. And 62 percent of voters support additional unemployment benefits. Mr. President, we are living in an unprecedented moment in American history. The last year has been a year the likes of which none of us have experienced in our lifetime. And the American people who are living in pain, in anxiety, in isolation, they are looking to the United States Senate and they are saying, are you going to hear and understand what we are going through? Are you going to do something to address the terrible problems in terms of health care, the economy, education that we are experiencing? Mr. President, it is no great secret that for many years the Congress has listened very attentively to the needs of billionaires, to the needs of campaign contributors, to the needs of lobbyists. Now is the time for us to listen to the needs of working families, the elderly, the children, the sick, the disabled, and the poor. Now is the time to restore confidence that the American government works for all of us and not just the few. And, Mr. President, I urge passage of this important, important piece of legislation. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor.